and welcome to Leadership PRN. This is the Dalhousie Faculty of Medicine podcast for leaders both established and emerging. My name is Dr. Lara Hazelton. I'm a psychiatrist in my clinical practice, and I'm one of the directors of faculty development in the Faculty of Medicine. Today, I'm very pleased to have with me as a guest, Dr. Scott Comer. Hi, Scott. Hi, Laura. How are you? Good. We've known each other professionally for a number of years now, and I'm really excited that you're uh, here on the show today. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Tell us a bit about yourself and your experience educating physicians about leadership. Oh, big question. Uh, I'm currently working, uh, I'm with the faculty of management at Dalhousie University, and I um, teach both undergraduate programs and graduate programs in business. And I also am on faculty with the Canadian Medical Association and the Physician Leadership Institute. And then I also do external consulting through a company called LeadX. Uh, a company called LeadX? LeadX. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, we do We do a lot of um, uh, strategic planning and facilitation work, uh, conflict resolution work, team skills, um, and a lot of leadership development. We spend a lot of our time with leaders in, in different industries, whereas uh, when I'm with the CMA working with the Physician Leadership Institute, I basically spend a lot of my time only with physicians. And how did you get involved with that? Oh, gosh, uh, probably 25 years, 20 or 25 years ago, I was approached by the CMA to ask if I could do a course. I was trained in working in conflict resolution, mediation, negotiation. And so when they approached me, uh, I was kind of, I thought, sure, I'll just try this, right? And then here I am, you know, decades later, still still working with physicians across Canada. So I would, there's work I love. I've done lots of work in healthcare and probably spent my the last 25 years consulting either internally or externally or even being an employee within a health system to work with uh, how do we make organizations more effective, how do we build our leadership capacity, working with senior leaders, working with people at every level of the whole, of every healthcare in place. I've even been brought into like operating theaters to work with with teams around their conflict where they wanted me to actually see what was actually taking place. Was that locally here or somewhere? That was in, that was on the West Coast. That was in it was in British Columbia. I think some of the people here at Dell might know you from um, the collaboration with Doctors Nova Scotia and the physician leadership um, program that they offer. Yeah, so in in this coming fall, fall of 2024, we are doing cohort six. So again, I was approached, and a great colleague of mine who many people know across Canada, Mamta Gautam, she and I created a, the Doctors Nova Scotia Physician Leadership Development Program. So we started working with cohorts of leaders across all zones uh, to develop leadership capacity, where, where leaders would have the same knowledge around innovation, complexity, and change, and conflict, and those types of skills, so that they could take those and start. we could start building capacity across the system. So taking a much more systemic approach to leadership development than I've seen in Nova Scotia. And that's been a successful program. It's been super successful. Like, and what's in, really interesting is we think we started around 2015, and we can now see where those leaders are today, and they're in key leadership positions, which is great. And so really excited to start our sixth cohort in, in the fall. What do physicians need to know about conflict? Everything. <laughs> I think in today's world, uh, conflict is one of the key skills. And when I when I approach conflict, I approach it from a very constructive, healthy conflict perspective. So I approach it from conflict actually builds hope. It builds hope for resolution. It, it builds stronger relationships. Um, hope is actually probably one of the strongest catalysts we have in today's world for innovation. So different perspectives and different ideas that we can actually move away from our positions and really get into what are other possibilities. Um, our, our system is really, we have a lot of strain in our system. And anytime there's strain, there's limited resources. There's limited ways of doing things, and that will always cause conflict. So I've been brought into you know work with conflict with heart teams where they're where they're struggling over, you know, which patient you know is probably most deserving of that particular resource called a heart, which most industries wouldn't even think about those types of things as a resource. So I think, and especially in healthcare, I think we really need to have people who are really adept at leveraging that healthy, constructive conflict, which actually brings all of these positive things. And so I believe it's a mindset. And often when people think, I say the word conflict and people, you know, have all these other ideas, it, it does the opposite of that. It destroys relationship. It, you know, it, it takes away from innovation. It, it, um, it moves our system further from where it could possibly be. It, it, you know, decreases capacity in people. It builds stress. So when I'm working with physicians, I really want to talk about what is that mindset that you have and then how do you build the skills to be effective at conflict to leverage the hope and the building of relationships and the skills and, and um and take, take it to a positive place. We need to have really strong conversations and really strong dialogues to understand what's taking place and also listen to people may, we may not have listened to that will be able to uh, provide information that we may not have heard before. 
and also be open to listening to what that information is. I'm interested, um, as you said, sometimes people have negative views of conflict because they do think that it, I think you just said, destroys relationships, impedes progress. So if on the one hand, conflict offers hope, as you say, Mm -hmm. um, why do so many of us have the perception of conflict as a negative thing? I think in many in many ways we've we've had conflict experiences which have left us with it's not safe. People have said things that they may not have said. People have been less fact based and maybe much more subjective, with made a lot of assumptions and and so I think a lot of people have stepped into conflict with initially with good intent and then after after an experience happening or after five experiences happening. Most people are saying, like, I don't really want to go into some, when somebody mentions conflict, if that's what it is, I don't want to go into that. So I think they've associated conflict with almost negative type things, where I'm trying to associate with really positive type things, right? But it is difficult. It is difficult because the largest factor in there is emotion. And when we get emotional, sometimes it's very hard for us to manage that emotion. So, if the, you know, physicians managing that emotion in conflict allows for people thinking through their conversation before they actually speak. So you mentioned safety. Do you want to say a little bit more about safety and how that works in conflict? Yeah, I think, I mean, we've had a lot of, we, we used to talk a lot about trust. Like, how do we build trusting relationships using the three pillars? So, I, you know, in those three pillars, I would really think about, you know, how do we build, you know, are people, do I trust our competence? Do I trust that they care about me? And then do I trust their integrity, which gets into honesty and it gets into morals and ethics and those types of things. And so if somebody says, I don't trust somebody or don't trust that team. I think, okay, that's really broad. What part of that are we really talking about? Or is it all three or is it just one? And more so, I think we're moving into a world of psychological safety. How do we create the cultures for all people using equity, diversity, inclusionary, accessibility practices to build psychologically safe places where people can say what they need to say, which is about conflict, me standing up and saying what I need to say, pushing back without looking, being negative, um, being able to say and come to work and be who I need to be and have ideas and state those ideas without somebody thinking that there's retribution or that that's going to be negatively impacted or simply that I'm a negative person. I've had a lot of people say, oh, that person always you know, says that and they always kind of push back and they're seen as not a, a creator. They're seen as almost like a, a negator. That people are seen that way if they're, if they're raising concerns? They're right? raising concerns. So that would mean to, to me that it wouldn't be a psychologically safe place for that person to continue to do that. So physicians learning how to create more psychologically safe environments is kind of a cornerstone of conflict. It's difficult to step into a a difficult friction, emotional conflict if I don't feel safe with you or with a group. So I think, you know, the the, the underpinning of all of it would be how do we create trust, trust, how to create psychologically safe environments, how do we change cultures that we currently have to that uh, what role does the leader or the physician have within that? Uh, what systemic approaches does the organization, health organization, have to support that? I think it's built from, does the organization support it and how do they support it? And how they support me as a physician? The team that I'm working with, do, what methods do we have in the team to create psychological safety? And then it comes back to me as an individual. Do I feel safe it, do, to say what I need to say, to be assertive, to speak up, to promote ideas that I think would be helpful? You mentioned that people wonder how they can push back without being negative. Mm. What what um, what is your advice for that? Um, sometimes I think when I when I hear somebody speaking, I understand it's a new idea, it's a new perspective, it's something that maybe is something people don't really want, may not want to hear. So I think the most important part of that's intention, you know, and acknowledgement. Now I'm you know I'm going to put something out here that might be just a little bit different from what we've been talking about or thinking. My intention is this can take us to a better relationship, a better service, a better practice, a better outcome. And once I state my intention, I think that's a really key piece that many of us may not be putting into our language, that that intention piece is a critical piece. My intention is not to be negative. My intention is not to be, um, you know, maybe disruptive, but not disruptive to the point that this is going to negate something or, you know, do something the opposite of what you would want. But it's actually just stating that intention and stating what you're actually speaking about and what the purpose of that is. So being explicit about it. Right up front. And if you think it's going to be a difficult conversation, I say, you know what, I'm going to put this out here and I hope you'll be open to listening and it might be a little bit of a different conversation. So also just kind of set the stage for what may happen as opposed to just stating something with no stage set and no intention. I think it makes it a little harder for people to hear. So you also talked about organizational factors and how 
important it is for organizations to be able to promote healthy conflict. How can organizations do that? I think some of the some of the key things they can have, which most organizations in today's world, especially healthcare organizations, do have, is they have respect in the workplace policies, what psychological safety is defined, what key behaviors, and I think people coming again from different cultures and different backgrounds and different perspectives have a different idea of words like respect, fairness, equity. So really, really taking time as an organization to unpack those and tell people what does that actually mean, but more so what does that mean in behaviors? So what would a behavior be that would look like that? What are behaviors that don't look like that? So I was working with a, a small project in, in it was actually quite a large project in British Columbia, and um, we just put we just put a you know made a graph and put disrespectful, respectful, um, harassing, bullying, criminal behaviors. Just go up and write on with pens. You know everybody got up in the room and write on with pens, and it was amazing how many people had the different behaviors on a different line. Something that was harassing and bullying, they'd had on disrespect. Some had disrespect was actually criminal. And so just, just we can't make assumptions that people in our system, which have, we have so many wonderful, great people from different backgrounds, actually understand what we're talking about when we say psychological safety, building trust. What are disrespectful behaviors? When has disrespect moved into harassing or bullying behaviors? And I think that's where uh, an understanding, organizations building a clear understanding of what that is, part one, and part two, then putting it into practice. And then part three would be, what happens if that doesn't happen? And what happens if people are not adhering to the guidelines of our environment? Um, then what, what, does, what, you know, what role does your organization have in that and what can they do? And what should they do? Uh, I think in some ways, I mean, obviously they should address it. Healthcare is very complex. It has many unions and has many parts and pieces, but they should directly address it. So it should be addressed. You know, I think a conflict, we often get in frictions with people. And, you know, when you start to have those frictions, that's when to have the conversations. Often we wait and we wait and we wait, and then it's not a friction anymore. It's built into something that's much, much larger. So I think organizations have, if, I, if I'm a leader and a physician leader, and I know that something is happening, I need to address it. And I need to be able to offer those, those individuals. So if somebody comes to me and says, I'm having a really difficult time and there's some conflict and some things are going on that I don't like with another individual, as a physician leader or other leader, I should be able to say, well, I can offer you a couple of things. I can coach you. If I coach you one, you want to go back and do it. Uh, I can bring you both in and I can mediate it. So that would be more mediating presence. And then the third piece would be, do you want somebody else in the organization to come in and address this? And then depending on the severity of whatever the behavior was, then the organization may have their own process for that, but would, would have processes for that. It's interesting what you were describing, how different people perceive um, different interactions as being more or less conflictual. I can, I can really see that that would be a, a common problem when you're trying to work with organizations. It was, and we, we, we were working to build a respectful workplace policy. So we're trying to build knowledge. And it was an exercise we were doing just to begin our conversation and realized at the end that was our conversation, that we were building a knowledge capacity of behaviors across an entire organization. So that people said, okay, when somebody said disrespectful, these are things that would be disrespectful. And they could actually name off those behaviors or be able to identify that behavior when it happened. You mentioned about how people are going to feel maybe more safe or trusting if they believe that the person cares about them. Mm -hmm. How can leaders convey to people that they work with that they care about them and their well-being? Well, this is a good question because I think the majority of leaders that I've ever dealt with care deeply about the people around them and the people that they're leading. Some people simply show that. And I think you can think of people in your own lives that, or strangers you've even met in a store somewhere, there's this caring that comes off of them and compassion. And other leaders, less so. And I think those leaders need to make it known. They need to ask questions about the person. They need to get to know them at a deeper level. They need to tell them, tell them that you really care about what's going on with their family and actually use those words. Um, and other people... It's just the nature of what they're doing and how they're interacting with the person, the caring actually does come off. So I think for some leaders, you need to make it much more explicit to people that you really do care. Even acknowledgement, use the skill of acknowledgement, just acknowledge the fact that it's we're in really difficult times. And I noticed that you were here for the past, you know, stayed a couple hours late. I know you have a family and I'm, you know, I care about that. I need to figure out how we can work this out so you can get home more. Do you think there's situations where things have just built up so much that it may be not possible to resolve a, a conflict that's become, let's say, toxic. Yes, because I think I think I, in the past you know decades, I've dealt with many toxic, what I would call a toxic relationships or toxic work environments. And there there are places where where I brought teams together or individuals together. And my first question is, 
without going into a false process, is this something you want to work on? Is this something you even want to resolve? And I think it's a really deep question. And so we've gotten, I've gotten teams together before and then have kind of backtracked and said, I'm not sure you want to solve this. And that's okay with me. I, but I, I like to know that that was one of the first questions. Like, you deeply want to go into this and solve it. And you want to go in and build a relation, rebuild a relationship. You want to re-engage with these people. And I think rebuilding, retrusting, re-engagement are really difficult things to do. So when it gets to that level, you might want to have a more mediated process than some of the conflict things we're talking about. Conflict on one and on one on one basis. Like I have my own conflict skills. There's a little bit of friction. I think we can work this out. Those conflicts are very different from those other situations where third parties often brought in to deal with those those really hard, difficult conversations where it's even difficult at times to get the people in the same room and to listen to one another for sure. There are some leaders who seem to be very sensitive to criticism. Have you noticed that? Yes, I have. And so, you know, sometimes even the word criticism, you know, like the feedback, right? So we, we you, they may see it as criticism and I see it as feedback. I see it as I'm going to say something that's only my experience. But I think when you, again, when you're giving somebody information, uh, make sure that it's coming from your experience. So in my experience, and I think we get my assumptions and my judgments and my stories about you confused with what the fact-based things are that I'm trying to tell you. And then it's felt as criticism. And often if we, if again, go in with positive intention, tell them what the intention is, tell them what our goal is, tell them this is only my experience. doesn't mean it has to be true, but this is my experience of what I've seen you do or what I've seen happen. I think that those two pieces are, would help people believe that it's less about me criticizing you and it's more about me giving you my experience of you. And again, you can still say that that's criticism and you know I'd be okay with that. But I, 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 would, I think a lot of it's the framing of what we're doing, the word choices we're using. And I think in conflict, a lot of people wing it. They go in and without having really a planned, thought out process. So I think one of the things for physician leaders is to really think about, you know, jotting a couple notes down, running it quickly by somebody to see if it sounds okay. In the same way that when we write an email that we know there's emotion in, we often say, I'm just going to read this to make sure that it doesn't, I'm not, doesn't sound like I'm too angry or there's not a lot of emotion here. So I think practice and preparation are two critical pieces of conflict. How do we build teams that use conflict? effectively? We uh, work with teams to build trust. So I think trust is the foundation of all relationships, including teams. And I think that we start to build guidelines. So a lot of teams, if you're forming, definitely use guidelines. So in the two pieces where we find conflict happening within teams is how we make decisions, how we talk about making it. Before the decision, we have to decide, here's an issue we want to talk about. So what's all the information we want to get? What are perspectives? Who should be in the room? Um, what information do we need? And then we start to get into the decision-making process. The first question we should ask is, how are we making the decision? Is it the leaders making the decision? I'm getting input as a leader. Um, I am, uh, we're going to make it together. Equal vote, majority rules. What's our backup decision-making process? So the clearer you are with those types of things, the better. There's still going to be motion. There's still going to be conflict. But we want conflict. But those types of things we can bring into the room. So I think, and, and then having strong team guidelines. Like really building with the team because... Once a team has guidelines about how they, how they want to behave with one another and with other people in the organization, then we can hold each other accountable for those guidelines. If there's no guideline, then there's no way to hold people accountable for what we're actually doing. So here are the guidelines team. We created them together. Are we committed to them? A com commitment's been established. Then we can hold one another accountable. So often with teams that don't have guidelines, and again, we have people from all over the world and all over the place, and with people with different, wonderful, great perspectives, um, we need to set some guidelines on how you know we take turns speaking. Um, if there's an issue with a person, you go directly to the person. If you have lots of issues with the person, you don't spend you know the next four hours telling everyone else on the team what horrible person that person is, um, or talking about them in derogatory ways. So just set some core guidelines. And then also really get clear about if we have conflict, what are the steps for our team on conflict? For example, if I have conflict with you as an example, I the first step would be I would go directly to the person and address it from my own experience with that person. Um, if that person, and I might have to go back a couple of times if I felt that resolution isn't happening with that person, but it was so important to me. Step two was I would I would tell that person, I'm going to go to our supervisor or manager, you know, whoever I directly report to. And I would want to make sure that I tell that person as, as a piece of respect 
to say, this is what I'm doing. The worst thing that could happen is that I go to that person without telling the other person, and then I, it feels like I've kind of stepped over them. Step three, the person I'm going to has actually said, did you go talk to that person? Have you had conversations? No, then go back and have some conversations. I can coach you. So there's an actual step to process to conflict that we unpack. Other things that I think te- are really important to teams are we don't all handle conflict the same way. If you, so I have, you know, if it's a team of 10 people, I have them write down a couple paragraphs about the things that they would want to know about uh, me in conflict. If you, if you bring up something to me, I want to listen to you. I probably want to answer you today, but I will definitely get back to you. You can bring it up to me and I want to hear about it. I will definitely respond in the moment. So those, those types of things. So I think there's, there's quite a few things that teams can do. Again, planning and, and setting guidelines are some critical pieces around how we make decisions. And I think that we need to, we need to spend more time doing that, which will save us tons of time later on. And then we can bring it into more healthy conflict within teams. That's very interesting about the decision making process because I it reminds me of situations I've seen where I think conflict arises because the decision making process wasn't clear. Yes. And I think then we have organizational conflict where I thought I was giving input. I thought I saw eighty percent of us say that we wanted it, but then the organization or the leader or somebody else made a completely different decision. But had I known I was only giving input and that was clear, I might have even approached it in a different way. So that can often create like organizational noise or, or, or conflict or chaos because people are unclear about what's really taking place. And then they make up stories, which gets into more conflict. Do you have any final words of advice for leaders about conflict? Uh, to, to learn as much about yourself in conflict and to be incredibly self-aware. So one of the questions I would, I would ask most leaders is, in conflict, what do you have a tendency to do? Do you know, uh, you know, do you know that you might have a tendency to use certain words when you hit an emotional level? And how do you back yourself down? How do you calm yourself down? Because a lot of emotion, sorry, a lot of conflict is your ability to manage your own emotion. And sometimes that would be, I'm at an emotional level at this point where I just need to disengage and come back to this conversation, knowing that if I continue to go, it probably won't go well. So, and, and what I tell everybody is if you don't know about yourself in conflict, find people you love because they can tell you everything about you. So I think the more you can learn about yourself, the more effective you can be in conflict. So I would start with self-awareness in conflict and then move out to others. Thanks so much for talking with us today, Scott. It's been very interesting. Lots of things for me to uh, to think about and, and uh, read a bit more about as well. And uh, yeah, it's a very important con- concept and important topic. This has been great. I really enjoyed this. I like to talk. I think I hope you, you get I like to talk about this topic a lot. So I've enjoyed this. Thank you for having me. And that's another episode of Leadership PRN. If you have a topic you would like to hear covered or someone you think I should interview, feel free to reach out to me at lara.hazelton at dal.ca or lara.hazelton at nshealth.ca. Until next time, take care.